Good evening, everyone. Oh, this mic's a little hot. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Arkan Fung, and I'm the academic dean here at the Kennedy School. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to tonight's forum on understanding red state rage and what to do about it. Before I introduce tonight's guest and topic, I want to thank the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation and the Institute of Politics for making tonight's conversation and many other great conversations possible. I encourage you to check out the IOP's website to find out more about upcoming events. Tonight, we're going to explore social and political divisions in America. In his 2012 book, Twilight of the Elites, <coughs> Chris Hayes argued that America is dividing in two different ways, vertically and horizontally. Vertical division is between economic and political elites, people who go to fancy schools and then go on to high-flying jobs, running com uh, companies and governments, those who call the shots, and everyone else. Horizontal division is between political left and right, between Bernie and Clinton supporters on one hand and Trump and Bush supporters on the other, if you like. If you had to put Harvard University into one of these four boxes, <laughs> left elite, right elite, left mass, right mass, which one would it be? <laughs> Everyone, this is the audience participation part. <laughs> right mass. <laughs> left elite, thank you. Right. Um, right. We try to solve that problem, but I think it's fair to say that's where we are now. Mm -hmm. And America is deeply divided. We understand that a lot of red state anger fueled the election of Donald Trump. The polls bear this out. In 2014, a Pew survey found that 36% of Republicans see the Democratic Party as a fundamental threat to the nation's well-being. But there's plenty of rage and fear on the left as well. In that same survey, two years before Donald Trump was elected, 27% of Democrats saw the Republican Party as a threat to the nation's well-being. I'm not sure how much more division, rage, and fear American democracy can take. Tonight, we're going to try to reduce that division and misunderstanding just a little bit. Our guest is Arlie Hochschild. She is Emerita Professor of Sociology at the University of California at Berkeley. She's written many amazing books that connect our intimate and private lives with big social and political challenges, including The Second Shift, The Time Bind, and The Managed Heart. She has received numerous awards. The three books I just named all made the New York Times notable uh, books of the Year list in the years that they were published. She received a Lifetime Achievement Award in Public Sociology from the American Sociological Association. She graduated from Swarthmore College and went on to earn an MA and a PhD in Sociology at UC Berkeley. Her most recent book, which is just great, is Strangers in Their Own Land. It was shortlisted for a National Book Award last year, and the book is the culmination of many years of ethnographic research in which Arlie sets out, as she puts it, to climb the empathetic wall. Huh? What wall, you might ask? If Harvard is in the left elite quadrant, Arlie has spent the last few years trying to understand the right mass quadrant. She spent many hours talking, participating in community events, sharing meals with conservative Tea Party folks in Louisiana. More than anyone else, she has helped liberal and mainstream readers understand grassroots conservative worldviews. Please welcome Arlie Hochschild. So the first question is, why Louisiana and why the Tea Party? How did you conceptualize the project and get to this you know, relatively small community where you spent so much time and energy? Well, uh, six years ago, I had a moment sitting in my office uh, in the sociology department at UC Berkeley. I thought, you know what? I'm in a bubble. <laughs> I'm in a geographic bubble, a media bubble. I look at the screen of my computer, it gives me back myself, I'm in an electronic bubble, and I don't understand what I'm reading in the papers about the right wing. Um, so how can I find a bubble that's as far right as <laughs> the sociology department in, in Berkeley, California, in a, in a blue state, uh, uh, is left? And where would that be? Well, that would be the South. But where in the South? Uh, I looked at the returns 
uh, on the proportion of whites who voted for Obama in 2012. In uh, California, it was over half. For the whole region of the South, it was a third. And for Louisiana, it was 14% of whites voted for Obama uh, in 2012. OK, that's the super South. Perfect. OK, let me go there. Let me look at whites. Let me look at older. Let me look at religious uh, people. And I went with this red state paradox. You know, how could it be that the poorest states, the states with the worst education, the worst health, the most uh, uh, road traffic murder uh, deaths, uh, the most disrupted families, uh, and the lowest life expectancy, the most pollution, are also the states that take more money from the federal government in aid than they give to it in tax dollars and revile the federal government. I, I admit, I, if, if you have a problem, um, you kind of want help. And I discovered in Louisiana an exaggerated version of this red state paradox. It was the second poorest state in the, the country, uh, had all those bad rates, but 44% of the state budget came from federal dollars. And they were super Tea Party and super, um, in the end, uh, uh, went for Trump. So again, I thought, perfect. OK, I'm right where I need to be. And one more thing, I began to smell the air. You know, I was at, staying at Aunt Ruby's B&B &B in Lake Charles, uh, uh, Louisiana, in the southwest, which is the center of the oil and petrochemical industry. They proudly call themselves the buckle in America's energy belt. And if I got in the car and went over the I-10 bridge to Westlake, my eyes began to sting. And I noticed everyone had bottled water, nothing like this. So I thought, wait a minute, I, I've come to study the far right, but uh, something else is talking to me, and that's the environment. Here was, an in, here was a place that was in Calcasieu, Paris, among the 2% most polluted counties in the entire country, and strongly d disinterested in regulation of polluters. So I thought, OK, this is a self-interest, a bio-interest. If you, who doesn't want clean air and clean water? Uh, so the closer I got to it, the more confusing it was. But that was the question I went with. And I had that my aim was to climb, as you say, this empathy wall to take my moral and political alarm system off, right? And permit myself a great deal of curiosity to get the hang of the experience uh, and beliefs of, of people different from myself. And you know, I, dis I started discovering things right when I started out, even before I left. Because when I talked to my Berkeley neighbors, they would say, you're going where? And to do what? Uh, oh, I couldn't do that. I would be so mad. I'd be so pissed. Oh, you know, no, I couldn't do that. Um, and others had a different reaction. It, it was, uh, they'd say, you're going to the south among the ultra-conservatives. Oh, huh, they go like this. As if to say, well, maybe she's a little more right than she <laughs> lets on, right? <laughs> she's going for similarity, don't we all? And I found that already I was learning before I, I set foot that that's a big missing idea for, for uh, and the big missing idea is that you can remain exactly who you are uh, and what you believe your commitments and really empathize with, with people very different from you. We all do that all the time, especially if you're parents, you do it. Um, and, um, but we don't apply it to political enemies. So, so that was, um, how this started. There are so many great ethnographic and sociological devices in the book and so many great stories. 
And one of them is the keyhole issue. And for you, the, well, the keyhole issue is you wanted to find an issue that would really be the, the prism and the razor through which you understood this larger problem. And for you, the keyhole issue is pollution and environmental justice, really, in a progressive frame. And in your book, you talk about many, many families. One is a Cajun family living on the land, living on land that has been very polluted by uh, industrial dumping, likely illegal, almost certainly illegal. Oh, I, I, I yeah. the, the, the polluter, yeah. <laughs> the guy that yeah, Mike. dumped the hazardous waste into yeah. my den. Mm. And uh, I'm going to read a passage here that is quite moving. You say, you write, shifting in his chair and coughing slightly, Harold continues, my brother-in-law JD was the first. He came down with a brain tumor and died at 47. Then my sister next door, Lily May, had breast cancer that went into her bones. My mom died of lung and bladder cancer, and the others up the bayou, Edward May and Lambert, both died with cancer. Julia and Wendell lived two miles from here. They got it. My sister grew up here but moved over to Houston River, and she's fighting cancer. My other brother-in-law, he had prostate cancer that went in the bone. They're telling you this story because they want you to know about the dumping. But then a couple of pages later, we find out that this family voted for Bobby Jindal twice, who is highly, highly opposed to environmental regulation. I wouldn't be surprised if the Harold family voted for Trump, which is, who is proposing to cut the EPA by 20 to 30 percent. So what's going on? <laughs> Well, um, a lot of things are going on, and incidentally, I dedicate the book uh, to uh, Harold and Annette Arino. Um, and um, I think for the there's a different answer for for each person that I talk to. For Annette it was, uh, and, and Harold, they were religious, and they believed in uh, the, the right of the child, they were uh, pro-life, and that was the big issue, and Jendal uh, did that, so okay. Uh, they, they didn't, actually, they're, the place that would be filled with political feelings and ideas had been replaced with religion and religious uh, ideas, and actually the last time I visited with them, after the book came out, I've been back twice, uh, I was having a lunch with them um, at Big Gumbo, thing, and, uh, and Annette uh, leaned over and said to me, do you read the Bible? And I said, I have read, <laughs> read the Bible. Um, and she said, you know, uh, with Trump, he's, he's a man who talks uh, before he thinks. And I'm not sure if we're going to get into an, a war. She voted for Donald Trump. And she said, I have a feeling, you know, that maybe the end is coming. So she was a believer in the rapture and actually felt that the man she voted for would bring on uh, the bad news. So that is one kind of story. Uh, it wasn't the main kind of story uh, I found, uh, but it, 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 and it looks inexplicable, except in the case of the Arenos, you understand the strain they are under. I, I think religion can move in where strains are greatest where people are subjected to the most anxiety. And in the case of Arenos, on one side was the polluted Bayou Din that I described that have all these stumps where beautiful cypress trees used to be. You can't uh, put a foot in a Bayou Din without getting, breaking out in a rash. Um, so pollution on one side, because they are, have been upstream or downstream from Pittsburgh Plate and Glass, from uh, uh, Citico, from Firestone. There's been rubber that's come in that. So they are really the toilet of industry, and that has been their backyard on one side. But on the other side, um, Axial has been uh, moving in. So they're, 
really sandwiched in and their land has been rezoned heavy industrial without their knowledge. So, okay, we can say they're religious ideas, this is false consciousness, or it doesn't make sense, they're irrational, but wait a minute, let's look at what they are facing, what, what the strain of that. Uh, I think we all need comfort <laughs> when faced with that kind of anxiety producing situation. And I see her religious beliefs in that light, in that light. For others, it was very different. I'll take another example would be Mike Sheff, who begins the book. He was born on a sugar plantation. Uh, he was fifth of seven in a Cajun family of a plumber. Uh, and he, his whole work life has been in oil, measuring things to materials that are used on the oil platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. He lives not far from what they call Cancer Alley, lower loops of the Mississippi. And I asked him, well, why don't you like the federal government? I, I put this red state paradox to him. He, he said, oh, it's embarrassing. We hate being in these low rates. It's embarrassment for us. But what we need is good jobs. I said, well, why don't you, why, why, don't, why isn't the government a good possibility for solving some of these problems? Well, government takes away community, he says. He loves community. We don't have enough community in the world, and they have it, and the government does things for people they ought to do for each other. That was his view. Well, what happened to him is that his community got taken away from him but it wasn't because of big bad government. What happened to him, he lived in a very wonderful little community uh, called Bayou Corn. Has anyone heard of Bayou Corn? Well, if you've read the book, you have. <laughs> pop quiz, pop quiz. <laughs> um, what happened there was uh, he, he at one point thought he had a heart attack because uh, things were moving around. There had never been earthquakes in that area, but there were earthquakes. And then they looked in the water, and there was bubbling up. And in fact, in the rain puddles, when it rained, it looked like Alka-Seltzer tablets, methane gas. So if you lit something, you know, big explosion could occur. And uh, then, um, at that point, um, people realized there was a sinkhole it was like you pulled a plug in the bathtub and a uh, hundred foot high and years old cypress trees were going down and being dragged into this, into this sinkhole and methane gas infused sludge was replacing it. Began an area like this and extended 36 acres by the end. So there was a massive evacuation. The community was gone. What had caused this? It wasn't big bad government. There was a, a company called Texas Brine, the drills for brine, very useful in fracking and making industrial products, down, down, down beneath the floor of the bayou into an underlying salt dome and cracked an edge of it, and that's what it caused the sinkhole. But that, that company was not heavily regulated, it wasn't barely regulated at all. There'd been a lot of winking eyes. So it wasn't the absence, uh, it wasn't the presence of government, it was kind of the absence of it that had lost him, his beloved community. And when I put that to him, see, I, I kept coming back. I was like the, <laughs> the guest that never left. Oh, hi, you know, here again, more questions. Um, and um, always, um, they, they, they wanted to talk, they did. And he, I asked him, tell me this. We, we went out fishing, which is a great place to do your ethnographic work, by the way. They can't leave, right? Here's a boat, right? <laughs> and now about race. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I did that. Um, but on pollution, um, I said, I don't, still don't get it, you know, uh, I may be slow, but what, what is it? Why, why is government so bad? Well, partly government was the North, 
and sort of the big bad north, you know, which was always wagging its moral fingers at uh, southern whites, you know, you're responsible of the sins of America. And they, they felt that the civil rights movement and even environmentalists, they thought, were kind of coming in and telling them what to do. But I don't give that much credence. Uh, Donald Trump is the North, right? And they voted for him. So another thing was the state of Louisiana was, was almost a bought state. This was an oil state. And oil assigned the state the moral dirty work of it had to do. And the moral dirty work took the form of saying, pretending to protect the citizenry from pollution and hazardous waste, uh, but in fact, handing out permits to pollute uh, very easily and turning a blind eye, not um, penalizing uh, polluting com com companies. So when I put that to him and said, look, it's oil that is calling the shots here, he said, oh, yes. So the, he thought that the federal government was a bigger, badder version of the state government. OK, so we have. The government is an instrument of the North. The government is an instrument of oil. But even that, I think, wasn't the main, main, main thing. Because in all the people that I came to talk to, 60 over five years, 40 hardcore Tea Party, uh, I came to think that I was listening to a deep story. A deep story, what's that? It's a story that feels true. So you take the facts out of it, the deep story, you take moral judgments out of the deep story. And what you're left with is what feels true. And I think we all have deep story underlying our political convictions. So what's the right wing deep story? The right wing deep story is that you're waiting in line for something like in a pilgrimage. At the top of the hill, you see the American dream. And your eye is on that. You're not looking behind you in line, you're looking ahead. And the line hasn't moved. Mike Schaff hadn't had a raise in two decades. And uh, you worked hard for this. And he had worked very hard in his last place of work. He was a big fisherman, loved fish. He knew what the face of five, ten kinds of fish. I never knew a fish had a face. You know, it's like this different faces that fish had. He loved fish, and he couldn't get out there because he hadn't have any vacation. First five years of his last place of work, he got one week of vacation, sick time, and vacation together. So if he got sick, there was no vacation that for five years. And the next five years, he got two weeks off. So here's a guy, you know, 64, looking forward to retiring so he can get some time to go fishing. Okay. So he's looking at this American dream. He wants to get close to it, feels he's not very close to it, and um, has worked hard. That's a strong sense of deserving. And then he sees, in this right-wing deep story, a line cutter. Well, what's, you know, that's not fair. That's not the rules. What is that? OK, that would be blacks who, through federal affirmative action programs, now have access that they have forever been denied uh, to jobs that used to be reserved for whites, and more numerous for women through federally mandated affirmative action programs now have access, such as myself, to jobs that used to, in my day, be reserved for men. And then would come uh, undocumented workers and people who didn't work but were getting handouts. And even in their minds, the oil-soaked uh, Louisiana brown pelican, this was the state bird, it was waddling in place because it was taking precedence over them and their, their right to jobs. And um, they would say, oh, the liberals, they're like animus. They, they worship animals and uh, value them more than people. That's something I often heard. OK, so all these line cutters. And then in another moment of this right wing deep story, there's Barack Obama, who should be impartially supervising the whole line. 
And it looks like he's waving to the line cutters. He is their president. He's favoring them. He's getting them to the goalposts, but pushing us back. He doesn't see us, can't see us. So uh, th then there's, well, maybe he's a line cutter too. How, and I heard this so many times, how did his mother, a single mother, afford a Harvard education? Duh, something fishy here. I heard the word fishy attached to that issue time, time, time again. Something fishy. This is rigged. Yeah, so he's a line cutter, uh, favoring the line cutters. The rest are pushed back, invisible. And then in a final moment of the right wing deep story, someone ahead of you in line, more educated, maybe from Harvard, turns and says, you know, you are a racist, homophobic, sexist, ignorant, uh, uh, Bible-thumping uh, redneck. And the word redneck, the word redneck was the tipping point for many people to be called. That was the N word for them. And uh, it was insulting after all of this. And what did they feel? They felt like strangers, actually, in their own land, not seen. They felt they were there, but not seen. And they were blue-collar workers um, and, and white, and they, they, felt, they felt in an honor squeeze. I, in this work, I kept thinking about the importance of honor and that they were kind of trapped in their search for it. Could they find honor in their work? Well, not really. They, they would tell you the company they worked for. Oh, I worked for PP&G. And then, but they don't say, well, look, I was an operator in, union f in Unit 5. It's not what they do at the company, but just the company they work for. So, and they weren't sure those jobs would last, not for their kids. So if they looked for honor from, by their uh, religion, no, they said, well, it's a secular culture out there. Um, you can't say Merry Christmas anymore. You have to say Happy Holidays or Happy, <laughs> just plain happy. In other words, they felt marginalized, more people were secular. You couldn't, you were a deacon in the church, but that wasn't a point of pride for other people. Uh, your attitudes were a source of uh, ridicule in the mainstream uh, culture. And your region was seen as a backward region. So they were, I think, feeling squeezed uh, in an honor squeeze as well. As, so, and, and even the environment really was alien to them, not theirs anymore. So by the end of the book, when I went to see Donald Trump in, uh, come out of the sky in the Trump plane uh, to New Orleans airport and saw throngs of people very excited waving their signs, I thought, I have for five years been studying the, the, the dry kindling, and now I've seen the match. As this man was saying, oh, okay, now I see you. The Democrats, they saw no sign of recognition of who they were, of this struggle, and, um, and they thought Donald Trump did. And it was almost like a secular rapture. He will take us up with, with him to his golden tower. Wow, thank you. So one more question, and then I'll open it up, which follows on the deep story, which is extremely powerful. And to, I've read it many mm -hmm. times. To mm -hmm. hear you tell it and elaborate on it is, is more powerful still. Um, part of your project in the book, especially at the end of the book, and I think part of our project, should be reconnecting America. And one of the things that you do at the end of the book is suggest that progressives also have a deep story that's quite different, right? And so probably many people in the room understand the deep story that Arlie uh, told, but reject it as a matter of American history. You just don't think it went down that way, right? So how do you think it went down? And so Arlie's rendering of a progressive deep story, and I want you to listen and see if this resonates. I don't want to presume anybody's politics, but for those of you who are, um, you write, progressives have their own deep story, one parallel to yours, one that they, uh, they feel you may misunderstand. In the progressive deep story, 
people stand around a large public square inside of which are creative science museums for kids, public art and theater programs, libraries, schools, a state-of-the-art public infrastructure available for use by all. They're fiercely proud of it. Some of them built it. Outsiders can join those standing around the square since a lot of people who are now insiders were outsiders in the past. Incorporation and acceptance of difference feel like American values represented in the Statue of Liberty. But in the deep liberal story, an alarming event occurs. Marauders invade the public square, recklessly dismantle it, selfishly steal away bricks and concrete chunks from the public buildings at its center. Seeing insult to injury, those guarding the public square watch helplessly as those who've dismantled it construct private McMansions with the same bricks and pieces of concrete privatizing the public realm. And so my question is, these deep stories stand so far apart. In the deep story, in the conservative deep story, government is the enemy. In the progressive deep story, government is the hero and enabler of these good things in the public square. In the conservative deep story, it's immigrants and people of color that are taking unfair advantage. In the progressive story, it's the privatizers and 1% that are taking unfair advantage. And so the question is, in your, I mean, you know Berkeley, I, you know Harvard, you know, kind of similar types, and now you know people in Louisiana from grassroots conservative Tea Party perspectives. Do you see any possibility of bridging those deep stories which seem so irreconcilable? It's the question before us, I think, as Americans today. And I do think that we are locked in a deep uh, struggle for the soul of our country. Uh, and the question is, uh, I think, I'm going to take part of your, of your question, what's going to be the role of reaching back to people with a very profoundly different deep story? Yesterday, uh, I think it was yesterday, there, day before yesterday, there was an article by Frank Rich, you, the uh, Times uh, commentator. I love Frank Rich. Uh, but he wrote an article that I disagree with. And I want to uh, give you a, uh, something that he said. He said that um, actually we don't need to reach across. We don't need to reach across. It, it's it's ill-advised. He says this, in a, he's reviewing my book, very respectful, but here's what he does with uh, the idea of empathy walls. Maybe like Hoke Shields' new friends in Louisiana oil country, they, that is the right, with the right uh, deep story, will keep voting against their interests until the industrial poisons left unregulated by their favored politicians finish them off altogether. The best course of action may be to respect their right to choose. Whoa. Well. <laughs> OK, no empathy there. I mean, you know, let them fry in hell. <laughs> and, um, okay, you know where I am with that? He wouldn't like it, but I have to say, I empathize with him. <laughs> I, I get it. I mean, it, 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 it is, we, I feel angry too um, because of my deep story. You know, these marauders have just come in <laughs> and uh, are taking, are robbing uh, the collective collective uh, bank. Um, but what do we do? Rich is saying, well, just uh, circle the wagons. We don't have to look at them. We don't need them. Forget about them. Let's just be mad uh, and uh, fight. I think uh, that there are two flawed premises uh, in that position. One is that the same person has to be doing the same thing. Uh, and uh, I believe we have three pillars of activism. I'm speaking as a citizen now uh, that I would like to see. 
One is a pillar we never thought we'd have to build, which is defending democracy itself, the independence of the press. Uh, it, the New York Times has now declared the enemy of the American people, the uh, independence of the judiciary. These aren't so-called judges, they're real judges. The whole idea of checks and balances. We should, and Frank is right, be angry and defend that, pillar one. Pillar two, reform the platform of the Democratic Party so that it speaks to the distress of, uh, of the blue collar class. Pillar three is to reach back to the near half of Americans uh, who voted for Donald Trump. And premise, so that's premise one, that the same person has to have do each thing. Now we can be separate people and do that. We, we need to coordinate as a, as, as a loyal opposition, but it, these are separate things that can be done by separate people. Second premise is that all Trump people are one big block, all similar. Not true, even in my little sample of 40, there was every kind of, 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 of view. Mike Sheff, when I last went fishing with him, he said, I said, well, how about Donald Trump? What do you think? Does anything give you hesitation? His answer, where do I begin? <laughs> Okay, well, interesting. A lot of crossover issues are possible. Some 9% of people that voted for Obama last uh, election voted for Trump this one, and looking for change. Okay, at least you can, that, that's substantial. But even so, I think it's very important through our schools, I think, through churches, uh, and through individual efforts, to, to find common ground, and I think it's there to be found on reducing prison populations. There I found a lot of agreement uh, on um, getting money out of politics, a lot of agreement, um, and actually on the environment, a lot of <laughs> agreement. So uh, that's precious. And I also feel that time is limited. This isn't something to wait for uh, because it could happen, I don't mean to be an alarmist, but it could happen that sometime in the next four years uh, a, a national disaster of some sort occurs, uh, or we go to war, some, some big conflict, and a state of emergency is declared, right? And so the rhetoric becomes uh, uh, loyal or disloyal Americans, right? And uh, this division that's already there becomes exaggerated and worse. I think in that instance, it's, it would be hugely helpful to have a thousand little bridges that could have been built, been built now. I would like to see public schools. Every, every school, you could start small and scale up, have students spend two weeks with a host uh, family, have coastal kids go inland, have inland kids two weeks to host family uh, on the coast, have the south go north, the north go south, um, have to, and then gather deep stories, you know? And kids are great with technology, they could video things and, and um, break bread together, do the dishes together, um, It'll have two effects. First, it'll, it'll, it'll show how different we really are. <laughs> that will be revealed. But it also will show that we are human beings and there are decent people on both sides. So I think it can be done through churches. I would have said if we had a union movement, it could have been done through unions. Um, but uh, I think the time is now for a crossover. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to take some questions from the audience. Uh, for those of you who have not been to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, there are three ground rules. First ground rule, all questioners must identify themselves. Second ground rule, one uh, question per person, and they must be brief, no speeches. And third ground rule, all questions end with a question mark. There are four microphones, two on the floor, two in the balcony, and so please line up if you have a question.
Yes, sir. Uh, Jay Gleason, you uh, talked just a minute ago about uh, federal emergencies. Well, we did have a federal emergency in Louisiana during Hurricane Katrina. We had another one during the Gulf oil spill. The federal government let those people down big time, like it does in many other instances. The federal government also caused the war in Iraq, the war in Vietnam, Gaza, I could go on and on. But why do you assume the government is a force for benign uh, positive change, when, uh, whether you're left or right? I don't care about Donald Trump's policies. These problems were there and they were compounded or, or instigated by the federal government long before anyone heard about Donald Trump as a politician. How can you really trust government to be a benign force, regardless of what policies you are? Good. Thank you for the question, sir. Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't assume that the federal government is always doing uh, good things. Uh, and uh, I agree with much of what you've just said, which are bad things that the federal government has done. But I believe in the possibility of good government. That's the difference. Hi, uh, my name's Savannah. I'm a senior at the college concentrating in sociology, so I'm a big fan of your work. Um, and I also grew up in a small, all-white town in southern Pennsylvania, so it's similar in some ways to what you wrote about in Louisiana really resonates with, with my life and my family. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, coming from that background and also now that I've had the opportunities I've had um, at Harvard, I guess I'm wondering, from your experience and your research, what do you think we should do moving forward? Like, if we were to help, you know, the kids in Louisiana and the, the people there to um, have better opportunities for healthcare or education or whatever will, um, you know, help uh, undo some of these paradoxes that are, you know, causing people to vote for par a party that doesn't, you know, have their best interests at heart. Like, what do you think, you know, tangibly, practically, we should do moving forward for these people? What, okay. Um, so what we should do moving forward to help them to uh, kind of elevate uh, the, all those rates that make Louisiana uh, kind of the poor and uh, distressed? Well, I think politics actually could uh, uh, make a big difference in that. You know, Louisiana had a governor uh, that, uh, Huey Long, uh, that actually did call for a chicken in every pot and gave out uh, school books to children and uh, black children and white children. And he was, uh, uh, he's looked up to still. And so I do believe actually uh, in the possibility of good government and I think if uh, I haven't given up on that as a, as a solution, but I think the people that I came to know were really stoical. They were used to and took almost felt attached honor to the capacity to stand bad news, right? So there's a cultural issue there, and I think um, reaching out in a respectful uh, way appreciating what they do have that's very easy to appreciate um, and uh, showing them that there is a better way in, in the course of describing your worldview. Um, it's good, I'll give you an example. I took my son to visit this Mike Schaff and uh, he said, oh, you know, California has very low rate of pollution. You know, and a third of our energy comes from renewables. We're, by 2030, going to be 50% of California energy will be from renewables. And you know, that doesn't pollute. <laughs> That's why they call it clean energy. And Mike said, hey, well, I think all states should be the same that way. One shouldn't be more polluted than the other. OK, you know, that was a good conversation. Up here on the right now. Thank you for being here. My name is Aria Florent. I'm a second year master's in public administration uh, at the Kennedy School. My question is, if you had a person in the left elite and a person in the right mass, and they swapped places for a weekend and went to each other's communities, where would you send them? What do you think that they, sh who do you think they should meet? Um, what kinds of conversations do you think that they should have in order to sort of maximize the amount of understanding and empathy um, that they gain out of the experience? Well, 
Um, okay, I would actually alter the categories. That like upper meets lower, uh, you know, mass, <laughs> individual here, mass there. Um, and I'd get us, I would love everyone to have the experience I've had, but it, it, it's, I think in the course of that experience, what you do is come to, to question our even American vocabulary for things. I began thinking about the difference between Wall Street and Main Street, for example. And then I thought, well, what is Main Street? You know, it, you think of small pharmacy that's, or bookstore that's uh, along the street. You think of small business, but you don't think of the plumber that put in the plumbing of Main Street. You don't think of the guy that climbed the telephone pole and put in, you know, the telephone wires. Uh, there is kind of invisible workmen and, and women that are part of that Main Street. We have to even start changing our language of it. Um, and uh, so uh, the closer you get, the less it looks like a mass. <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. And uh, what I'd love is for people to be able to have the kind of experiences I did by, uh, and the way I did it was um, ask people if I could get to know them, you know, that I didn't know them and didn't understand them. And people were most generous, really most generous of in, sharing there. What people would say is, well, I'm glad you've come, you're writing a book. You know, um, tell the people, tell your people. <laughs> I'm coming back to tell my people. <laughs> you know, my mass, <laughs> you are my mass, <laughs> uh, that the people back there, it was like I was, you know, given a message to take, um, that we're good, we're honorable, we're smart, we're capable of ambivalence as much as you are. and. Uh, nuance, uh, and that is the message, actually. They have different empathy maps, but they have a lot of empathy and a lot of community. More community than we do, or than I do, yeah. Over here. Hi, um, my name is Claribel Santiago. Um, I am a loyal Green Party, Green Rainbow Party um, constituent, and um, I won't change. Um, although I feel like we're in the valley and there's a long climb up the mountain. Um, but um, how, how are we going to um, get folks on board to change the environment if everything is so capitalist? And so, um, you know, it's... it's um, and, and Dr. Jill Stein, she's been sending this message and nobody's listening. Mm -hmm. And I won't change, I will not, I will not become a Democrat. And, and I believe in the green rainbow culture. So, um, and, th and that's the thing, you know, because we're poor, we have no money, we won't accept any money. Um, uh, special interest groups, um, it's that climb up that hill, that, that, that mountain that, that's, that's going to kill us. You it's going to bury us. That you mountain's will find, gonna fall on us. Actually, um, uh, you would be surprised that you will find a lot of people that agree with you among Trump uh, supporters. Uh, <laughs> they they will agree on the environment and um, what what's happening in Louisiana is that big capitalism isn't being very friendly to them. It's not that they love these companies, they don't. These are highly automated companies with, with very few permanent new jobs coming in. There are temporary jobs to build up uh, what's now happening, they're building them up. Temporary jobs are done uh, by Mexican laborers that go back uh, to Mexico, and uh, there are man camps being built for Filipino pipe fitters. They're importing cheaper Filipina pipe fitters. So these big companies, it's not that you have capitalism worshipers among the Tea Party. They, they know this isn't a great scene for them. And uh, they would love to see green energy come in. And it actually has begun 
to uh, come into Louisiana. So, and uh, it turns out that there are more uh, jobs in, um, in solar than in, uh, in coal nationwide, average wage $26 an hour. They, they perk up at that. So there's more crossover uh, than you might think. My name is Mandy Rice. Uh, I read your book for a class at the Divinity School called Building Just Peace, which is about coalition building. Um, so we're very glad that you're a part of this national conversation. Um, one of the stories that I have heard you tell is uh, a conversation, one of those conversations in a fishing boat about race, um, <laughs> yeah. where a guy told about his um, experience of integrating his high school, and you asked him, like, well, gosh, did you make any new friends? And, and he said to, in response that you really made him think. That's right. Um, I don't want you to elaborate on that particular story, but I wonder if you have ideas of other good questions like that that you asked that, that provoked not a, an instantaneous response, but something more nuanced mm -hmm. that yeah. we could ask. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, uh, I think a good question to ask is, um, gosh, where did you get that information? Uh huh. <laughs> Gee, I haven't heard that. Um, yeah, where did you learn that from? Uh huh. What was the name of the reporter? Uh huh. Brett Bart. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so I think Socratic method, a lot of questions instead of statements and uh, to open, figure your opening ground. You're spading, that you're letting the soil, impacted soil, get some air. Uh, so a lot of questions, yeah. Well, one man, for example, he thinks, I, I was uh, suggesting, well, you know, it's getting a little scary. Don't, isn't it American to believe in checks and balances? Isn't that the American thing? He was saying, oh no, the American thing is to be able to go to war and defend your country against external enemy. And I said, well, um, but do you ever worry that uh, Donald Trump might want to be the only voice and, you know, kind of, we've, we've seen that before in European history, you know? And he said, no, the real fascists are on your side. Uh, I said, oh, well, why, why do you think that? Well, in Berkeley, California, indeed, he's right, there were uh, a group of anarchists, they all dress in black, and they, they light uh, fires, and he said, that, that's, those are the brown shirts on your side. And in truth, no, no progressive, per well, the, the officials of UC Berkeley said, look, this, these were non-students, and we think it's deplorable. Um, but we didn't have a political voice saying, you know what, this is bad, we don't, we disavow uh, violence. Um, so I would, you know, not be frightened by that kind of statement, but to ask where it came from, and sometimes the answer back is, gosh, I see why you think that, um, and uh, that's a problem on our side. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, up here. Hello, my name is Michelle Borstein. I'm a Neiman Journalism Fellow. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about when you said that political ideas were replaced by religious ideas, and if you felt like you could separate out what were the most common religion conversations that you had, whether they were about, you talked about the rapture, whether they were really theological discussions, or how you, how you draw out what are the most common religious themes that you heard most often. Mm. Mm. Well, my goodness. Um, Um, the first part of your question said, uh, asked me to go back to a part of the book where I said that for this Areno couple that we talked about, it seemed that politics, they'd given up on politics and religion took the place of politics. I felt there that often the churches, uh, I was in the presence of a failed state, a whole state really was doing uh, 
promising things that it was not delivering, and I understood people's profound disappointment with it. And at the same time, it seemed like the church as an institution was moving forward to offer more and more services, and people were tithed 10% of their income to pay for these services. But if you had a problem, if it was a marital problem, let's say there was counseling you could go to in the church. If uh, you, your children uh, needed counsel, well, there was that too, and there was childcare. Uh, if your mother-in-law needed to lose 30 pounds, well, there was a gym downstairs. And they were proud of this, and it was, uh, if, if the church had become a source of the social services, then back in Berkeley, California, you know, a, a much more functional state was doing. So it, it, there, was, there was that. And uh, then there was a prevailing metaphor of the rapture. This is true in the evangelical churches. And I came to understand that in a different way, too. Um, rather than saying, oh, no, this is fictive, or, you know, or wrong, I, I understand that as a metaphor. In, in, the, in the view of the, of, of the rapture, the world is coming to an end. For the blue-collar worker uh, in the South, the industrial world that gave them dignity and jobs has come to an end, in fact. Those jobs really are, are going out. Uh, they did for blacks first, and now it's hitting whites. Uh, so they see that there's a, sense, a focus on loss of a world. That's a metaphoric description, I take it as that. And then they're looking for to rise up. God will see that I have been good in my life, and I will be of the elect rise up. And in a way, I take that as an expression of the class divide. <laughs> you know, it is true that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer, so even the idea of that division seemed to have a metaphoric ring uh, to me. And, um, and if you look, in fact, if you go home and Google pictures of the rapture, what you will notice is that the images of kind of svelte, well-dressed people like like you, seemed, you know, with their high heel shoes on, they're going up. And the people down look a little, you know, grungy. So it, it did look like a class story. And I think social class is the thing that we have not addressed. I didn't just go to a different region. I went to a different class and, and learned to respect, in a way, um, more ways like they respect. And um, that did not in any way erase the profound differences, especially on the question of race, that I felt with them. But uh, it, so this, this question of empathy and the question of how much you stay your, who you are while you're empathizing with a person very different is forever present with you. That is the work. I would call it the emotional work that a researcher does. Um, and uh, that we all do, I think, when we reach out for diversity. I think this just extends the, the, the issue of diversity one class over. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Arlie, for an incredible conversation. I think it was a master class in oh, political and cultural yeah. sociology. You know, I was doing a job interview. Um, I wasn't being interviewed. I was interviewing someone, and I, I asked them, what their superpower was. And your superpower, I think, is an unbelievable ability to empathize and listen and really hear things in a deep, deep way. And I think it's an example for the rest of us. And thank you for your call to action to reach out and reconnect, which I think in our current political environment is one of the most challenging tasks there is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Arlie Hochschild.